welcome and thanks for making time to join us tonight for the return of ACT speaker series. We are really excited to get back to it. Uh, we were hoping to return in person, but we're not quite there yet. So um, we're just thrilled to have, as I said, 70 or so people registered and hopefully we'll get somewhere close to that with everybody on today from the comfort of your homes. Uh, my name is Gal Patashnik. I'm the Outreach and Member Services Director here at AFT. And uh, before we begin, I just want to make sure everyone's aware that tonight's event is being recorded for future viewing. So just uh, be mindful of that. Uh, I also want to start by thanking our speaker, Matt Tarr, for joining us um, from a little bit farther south than there we are where we are, um, but not too far. It sounds like you're in the Latonia area there. Um, Matt works for the UNH Extension as a professor, professional wildlife biologist and forester. Uh, and he works throughout New Hampshire in close partnership with New Hampshire Fish and Game to assist private landowners as well as communities in improving habitat for wildlife, which really makes him perfectly suited to be speaking to us tonight. Um, I know we're all excited to hear what he has to say. So I am going to pass it over to Matt to do some housekeeping and, uh, and get us started. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Uh, sure. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, chat with everybody tonight. And thank you for joining us, taking the time out every evening to join. Again, my name is Matt Tarr. I work for University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension as our statewide wildlife specialist. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Extension, we're, we're very basically the, the public outreach arm of UNH. Um, it's our role to take the research that happens at UNH and other, res and other um, research institutes and bring that research out to the public so folks can use it and put it to work to make good decisions. And uh, it's also our role to, 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 um, to work with landowners and communities throughout the state and um, learn about the questions and challenges that folks are dealing with and bring those challenges back to the researchers at the university to ensure that UNH is conducting research and work that's meaningful um, to the people of New Hampshire. So I work in the natural resources program of Cooperative Extension. Um, there's myself and we, I, we have uh, a staff of uh, extension foresters and other wildlife biologists. Um, and we, we have an extension forester in each of the 10 counties uh, of the state. And um, all of our staff are available to meet with landowners and community members um, on your land free of charge. Um, I will provide you my emails up now and I'll provide my contact info at the end of, of the presentation again. And, uh, but uh, I say your, your call or email gets me out of the office. And so I encourage folks to uh, give us a buzz and uh, we can happy to come out and take a look to see what you have on your land and, and um, guide you through the steps of, of working with your property. So um, tonight's presentation, it's about a half an hour and then uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions. I guess what I'd like to, um, just some housekeeping, I'd like to be sure that everybody has their, their microphones muted just so we don't have a lot of uh, noise um, happening in the background. Um, we're gonna leave all of the questions until the end of the presentation. And so I also ask folks to not use the chat function during the presentation, um, just so we're not, so it's not um, distracting to, to all viewers. So there'll be plenty of time for questions and I'm happy to stay on as long as folks you know, have questions, and so we'll leave those to the end. So with that, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this presentation um, is titled Birds of Fields, Forests, and Shrublands, uh, Encouraging Wildlife Diversity via Habitat Diversity. And so in this presentation, I'll discuss the different bird species specifically that are associated with our most common upland habitat types that we have here in New Hampshire, and those are fields, forests, and shrublands. And so I'll also provide a quick overview of some of the typical ways that we manage these habitats to support a diversity of bird and other wildlife species. So I'll discuss field habitat first, and we'll begin with just a basic definition of the habitat conditions that function as field habitat for wildlife. And so fields can be recognized as upland or non-wetland openings that are dominated by herbaceous, which are non-woody plants. And these, have, these are habitats that contain few or no trees or shrubs. And as a wildlife biologist, I distinguish different fields based on how they function as wildlife habitat. So as habitat, fields can be grouped into one of two primary types here in New Hampshire. 
So fields that function as grassland habitat and then all other fields. And I'll, so I'll first discuss the grassland habitats. <clears throat> so think of grassland habitats as large fields, fields that are at least five acres, but ideally greater than 30 acres in size. So these large fields, they're required, habit, required nesting habitat for a small number of grassland dependent birds that we refer to simply as the grassland birds. So populations of these birds are declining dramatically throughout their entire range, but especially here in New England, primarily as the result of habitat loss. So the two grassland bird species that are most likely to occur on lands um, owned by private landowners or communities are the bobolink and the savanna sparrow. So bobolinks require fields that are at least five to 10 acres in size for nesting, and savanna sparrows rarely nest in fields less than 20 acres in size. And so populations of these two species are declining rapidly, but they still do occur pretty predictably in most of the grassland habitats of these sizes that we have here in New Hampshire. Two additional grassland bird species that you might encounter are the eastern meadowlark and the grasshopper sparrow. These birds rarely occur in grasslands less than 30 acres and they are becoming very rare. Both of these species are listed as threatened species here in New Hampshire. <clears throat> So to function as habitat for the grassland birds, a field not only has to be large, but it must be very open. And so there are a number of things that affect what we call the openness of a field. <clears throat> the first is the, is the topographic position of the field. So grassland birds prefer fields that are like located on the top of ridges, especially when the forested edge of the field is at a lower topographic position than the center of the field. So this makes the sky in the field appear large and gives the field a very large and open field. And so we find that bobolinks will often occur in fields as small as five acres if these small fields are located at the top of ridges where the surrounding trees are or appear very short in relation to the field. By comparison, grassland birds often avoid fields located in hollows or topographic bowls especially if uh, in, like the field here in the picture, if the field is surrounded by tall trees, that makes that field look like it's in a hollow. So these types of fields often must be very large, at least 10 acres in size for bobolinks to nest in them. <clears throat> very open also means that there should be no trees or shrubs growing within the field and the, sh and the field should be wide, not narrow. So think blocky square or rectangular fields, not long and narrow fields. So for example, here's a field that's large enough to function as a to be to be grassland, but it's too narrow to actually function as grassland. And so the reason that it's too narrow is because grassland birds, they typically avoid nesting in fields where the field edges are close to the center of the field. And this is because the grassland birds prefer to nest as far away from field edges as possible. These birds make their nest directly on the ground. And this makes them especially vulnerable to predators that tend to hunt along field edges. So these birds tend to only nest in large fields and they tend to locate their nests near the center of these fields. <clears throat> so grassland birds are nesting and raising their young between about mid-May through the end of July. They should be showing up here in New Hampshire in the next couple of weeks. Savannah sparrows are already showed up. I heard one yesterday. Fields that we manage as nesting habitat for grassland birds should be mowed once each year, no earlier than August 1st, and ideally the cut grass should be removed. So this yearly mowing keeps the field dominated by grasses rather than allowing wildflowers and young shrubs to grow up in the field. And mowing after August 1st is late enough that nests and fledgling birds won't get destroyed by the mowing equipment. So I consider all fields that are unlikely to function as nesting habitat for grassland birds as other fields. <clears throat> so these include any fields that are less than five acres in size, fields of any size that have trees or shrubs growing within the opening of the field, and fields that are long and narrow or those that are irregular in shape with peninsulas of trees that extend towards the center of the field primarily because these fields don't provide the grassland birds with an area to nest away from the field edge. In any field, regardless of its size, 
where we are not trying to maintain nesting habitat for grassland birds, the habitat goal is usually to have the field support the greatest variety of wildlife as possible. And the best way to do that is to allow wildflowers to grow up in the field. And this is accomplished most easily simply by reducing how frequently the field is mowed. So mowing a field only once every two to three years allows a variety of flowering plants to grow up naturally into a field. But this frequency of mowing usually keeps a field from reverting to shrubs. And a way to further enhance habitat diversity is to divide a field into sections and then mow the different sections in different years so that you never mow the entire field all at once. So here, the recently mowed short grass areas of this field provide ideal foraging habitat for American robins, morning doves, chipping sparrows, and northern flickers. And if this were a large field, that short grass area might provide hunting habitat for American kestrels and red-tailed hawks. The areas that are left unmowed provide numerous habitat benefits, including providing a variety, of providing a diversity of flowering plants to support pollinating insects, and greater insect abundance improves foraging habitat for eastern bluebirds, for tree swallows, and eastern phoebes. And areas of tall grass and wildflowers can also enhance foraging, foraging habitat for the grassland birds. Because what we find is that grassland birds regularly forage on field edges and within small fields where we wouldn't expect them to locate their nests. So a great way to manage a grassland for grassland birds is to maintain the nesting habitat in the center of the field as tall, dense grass by mowing the center of the field once yearly after August 1st, and then maintain the edge of the field in a mixture of grasses and wildflowers to encourage an abundance of insects, which grassland birds require for raising their young. So how wide this edge can be, it kind of depends on how big the field is, but I often try to make these foraging edges at least 30 feet wide if I can. You would then mow the foraging habitat along the edge of the field once every two to three years. And ideally you would mow different sides of the field in different years. So you're always maintaining some standing tall grass and wildflowers around somewhere in the field. So allowing flowers to go to seed and remain standing during, the, especially into the winter is a really simple way to further enhance wildlife foraging opportunities within a field. So flower seed heads provide important fall food for American goldfinches and important winter food for dark-eyed juncos, common red poles, meadow voles, and white-footed mice. And many pollinators we find actually lay their eggs in, in hollow flower stems. So leaving these unmowed further supports healthy pollinator populations. <clears throat> the tall grass and wildflowers provide nesting cover for wild turkeys, fawning cover for deer, and summer cover for turtles. And the tall grass areas also develop, will develop a thatch layer of dead grass that provides ideal cover for small mammals and snakes, which then provide important food for foxes, hawks, and owls. So there's all sorts of ways that you might divide a field into sections, but I usually set up a mowing rotation so that only one section gets mowed each year and every section gets mowed about once every two to four years. Fields that are mowed less frequently, like once only every five years or so, tend to get, get shrubby. And then we see a huge increase in the number of wildlife species that will use a field once the field gets really shrubby, or, which is around the point when shrubs start to cover at least 30% of a field. And at this point, our field is no longer considered field habitat. It's now considered shrubland habitat because it now supports wildlife species that require shrublands. And we would consider this field to be, in, to be old field shrubland, which is simply a shrubland that grew up after a field stopped being mowed or grazed. All right, so what defines shrubland habitat? So shrublands are upland openings that are usually dominated by a combination of shrubs, saplings, grasses, wildflowers, and ferns. And there are few or no overstory trees. Um, if there are trees, uh, they are spaced widely enough to not inhibit sunlight from reaching the shrubs. Shrublands go by a variety of different names, including early successional habitat, young forest, and thickets. So in New Hampshire, we have about 36 species of birds that require shrublands as their primary nesting and foraging habitat. 
So these include prairie warblers, brown thrashers, chestnut-sided warblers, indigo buntings, field sparrows, blue-wing warblers, towhees, and all their flycatchers. And collectively, we refer to these 36 species as the shrubland birds. Now these birds require shrublands for the specific habitat structure that provide them with cover for nesting and perches for singing, abundant insects for raising their young, and abundant fruits for raising their young and preparing for fall migration. Now, although there are a few shrubland birds, including cardinals, Carolina wrens, mockingbirds, and song sparrows that are commonly observed around yards where there are shrubby edges, Many shrubland birds are uncommon in shrublands less than about two acres in size. And for most of the shrubland bird species, shrublands greater than five acres in size provide them with the best, typically provide them with the best breeding habitat. Now, historically, large shrublands occurred here in New Hampshire in unique communities, such as pitch pine scrub oak barrens, on rocky ridge tops and in coastal dunes. And they also were created in other areas by periodic natural disturbances, such as large wind and ice storms. So now all currently all of these types of shrubland habitats are very uncommon today. And as a result, populations of many shrubland birds are declining dramatically. And in most landscapes today, uh, shrubland birds rely on human created shrublands as their primary habitat. So today, some of the most important shrubland habitats here in New Hampshire include tr shrubby transmission line rights away that are maintained in a shrubby condition by electric companies, um, active and abandoned gravel pits, which tend to stay shrubby due to harsh growing conditions, shrubby old fields, and, and large young forest openings created via timber harvesting. So creating uh, shrubby old fields is accomplished simply by allowing shrubs and saplings to grow up into a field naturally. And once shrubs are established, you don't really ever need to cut the shrub species, but eventually you will need to periodically cut individual trees that begin to grow tall enough to overtop and shade out the shrubs. So in a small shrubland, this can be done using a chainsaw or a brush saw, which is basically a weed whacker with a saw blade. So you would basically schedule one day or a weekend each year and you go in and cut out all of the tall saplings. In larger openings, we typically use a brontosaurus or a Rayco style forestry mower to mow the trees about once every seven to 10 years. So this, this opening in the picture was mowed flat because it was an overgrown clear cut that was all tree stump sprouts and few shrub species. But we typically have these mowers mow around any shrubs. So habitat biologists and foresters also regularly use clear cutting as a tool to convert specific forested areas into shrubby habitats. So this is a 25 acre clear cut that was made on the London da Londonderry Town Forest, specifically for New England, endangered New England cottontails but it currently supports all of the shrubland bird species that we would expect here. So this area was cut using whole tree logging equipment. The area was allowed to regenerate naturally and then half of the clear cut was cut again with a brontosaurus to keep it in a shrubby condition. So big openings like this are super valuable habitat for shrubland dependent wildlife, but these big openings need to be planned very carefully because in many areas of New Hampshire, especially in central and southern New Hampshire, creating large clear cuts may result in a significant loss of mature forest habitat, primarily because much of our landscape is already heavily fragmented by development. And so if this development pressure hasn't reached the area of the state where you live or work in, it very likely will. So the approach I'm about to describe for locating large shrubland openings to benefit wildlife really is appropriate to, to apply in any area of New Hampshire. So in the next slide, I'm going to zoom in to this area um, that's right here. Notice, notice the big uh, gravel pit um, here. Okay, so the area that I've outlined here in yellow, that's the 25 acre clear cut from the slide previously um, on the London Dairy Town Forest. And this clear cut was located very strategically it was nestled near the junction of two transmission line rights away, these long uh, linear openings. 
um, and uh, near the very large gravel pit there to the west. Here, smaller clear cuts have been made more recently to create additional shrubland habitat as the older clear cut matures. So combined, these clear cuts, the right of way and the gravel pit provide an ideal complex of shrubland habitat in close proximity to one another, which allows birds to regularly fly among these openings. But note that these large clear cuts were clustered together and they were located on the edge of, not in the center of, these big blocks of mature forest habitat. So timber harvesting is conducted in these blocks of mature forest, but here trees are removed as individual trees or in very small groups with the specific intent of maintaining mature forest structure, tree health and diversity and, tr and seed production for wildlife. So this is important because here in New Hampshire, we have about 34 species of birds that require mature forest as their primary nesting habitat. So our research shows that many of these birds regularly forage in shrublands and in wetland openings during the breeding season and during migration, but these birds require large stands of mature forest for breeding. And so I, I call these the mature forest birds. So mature forest birds regularly occur in habitats where mature trees create a forest canopy that is over 30% closed, which means that when you're in the forest and you look up, over 30% of the sky will be blocked by the foliage of mature trees. And in fact, most species of mature forest birds prefer to nest where the canopy is over 60% closed. And so while we regularly find these birds in small forest fragments, even in suburban landscapes, most of these species prefer to nest in blocks of forest that are greater than 100 acres in size, because these large blocks have more, it's kind of similar to the grassland birds, these large blocks have more interior space away from the forest edges, where the risk of nest predation and nest parasitism by brown-headed cowbirds is high. So there's a lot of different species of mature forest birds and each species has its own requirements for the specific forest types and conditions that it prefers or requires. So overall, what forest birds occur within an area is influenced by the forest type, meaning whether the forest is dominated by hardwood trees, softwood trees, or mixed forest. And, uh, and what birds occur is also determined by the forest structure and by the presence or absence of special features. So birds generally first select their habitats based primarily on the presence or absence and the density of different forest layers. So some birds prefer a forest with a completely closed canopy with little or no, no understory gaps that let in enough sunlight to support a shrub layer and or a mid-story layer. And some birds prefer a forest with larger gaps that let in lots of sunlight and that have a very dense shrub layer. And so what we find is that landscapes composed of different forests that vary in their structure are most likely to support a diversity of mature forest bird species. So foresters and wildlife biologists, we use commercial timber harvesting as the primary tool for enhancing and maintaining diverse forest structure for wildlife habitat and for birds especially. So commercial timber harvesting basically means that the cut trees are sold to offset the cost of conducting this habitat work and this often generates revenue for the landowner. So through timber harvesting, trees are removed to create gaps of different sizes so we can create specific plant structure to encourage different wildlife species. So I've already mentioned how we use large openings, particularly clear cuts, to create large areas of young forest or shrubland habitat required by the shrubland dependent birds. But when we're managing habitat for mature forest birds, we want to maintain a relatively intact under overstory but in some areas, we remove individual trees or small groups of trees so we can establish and maintain diverse mid-story and shrub layer structure. 
So as a general rule, openings between about a quarter of an acre to an acre in size are often ideal for maintaining intact forest overstory cover and for enhancing understory cover and foraging habitat for the mature forest birds. So most bird species that require mature forest for nesting also seem to require small shrubby openings as part of their habitat. So we've done a bunch of mist netting studies here in New Hampshire and other researchers have done this out in the Midwest. We find that adult mature forest birds readily forage in these shrubby areas. They're foraging there for insects where they, when they're raising their young and adult and young birds forage for fruit in late summer and in the fall as they prepare for migration. And so when young birds fledge uh, or, they or when they leave the nest, they are like this bird here on the right. They're like little chicken tenders that can, can't fly very well and they are super vulnerable to predators. So these dense shrubby areas provide them with ideal dense cover to avoid predators and they have abundant insects that these little, little birds require to grow quickly. So small forest openings such as single tree and group selection are great for enhancing cover and foraging opportunities for a huge variety of wildlife species. And as a general rule, we find that these small openings tend to mostly benefit wildlife that already occur within the forest on your property by enhancing cover and foraging opportunities. However, there are a few shrubland birds that will be attracted to openings as small as a third of an acre, including chestnut sided warblers, common yellow throats, and morning warblers. So we believe that these birds likely evolved as what we call gap specialists um, that were able to utilize small shrubby openings created when single old growth trees or small clusters of old growth trees died and fell down and created sunny gaps in the forest. You know, the, uh, an, old grow, an old growth oak tree, when it fell, created a huge gap, uh, way bigger than the than the oaks that we typically have on our landscape today, you know, much larger trees, sometimes a quarter of an acre gap. So what we find is that if we're interested in maintaining the full diversity of bird species on our landscape, we need to incorporate openings of all sizes across the landscape, and we need to locate these openings where they are most appropriate. So if you're planning a timber harvest on your property, and you, especially if you plan to incorporate large openings in that harvest, I would welcome an opportunity to visit with you, with your forester and or with your logger to help you locate these openings in areas where they are likely to maintain and encourage the greatest variety of birds and other wildlife species. So, kind of finishing up here, when we're timber harvesting, we also try to retain special habitat features, such as any dead standing trees and any live trees with visible cavities, so we can maintain required nesting and foraging habitat for birds and other wildlife. So what we find is that trees of different sizes accommodate different wildlife species, so it's best to retain trees of a variety of sizes across the landscape, and especially any cavity trees that are at least 18 inches in diameter, because those larger diameter trees have the ability to provide habitat for the widest range of wildlife species. Further, one of the best ways to encourage and maintain a diversity of birds and other wildlife is to encourage and maintain a diversity of tree and shrub species that together produce a variety of seeds, nuts, and berries. So we often use timber harvesting to remove trees to make openings that allow healthy oaks to expand their crowns, to capture more sunlight and produce larger acorn crops. And we remove trees that overtop berry producing shrubs to provide these shrubs with sunlight to enhance their fruit production. So in nearly all areas of New Hampshire, there's lots of opportunities for private landowners and communities to work together to maintain a healthy diversity of mature forest, shrubland, field, and wetland habitats for wildlife. And in, in each area has its own unique opportunities and challenges. So if you are interested in learning more about how to conserve and manage wildlife habitats, be sure to get assistance from professional wildlife biologists and foresters so we can help you with your efforts. So here in New Hampshire, 
your first and easiest step is always to call your county cooperative extension forester. So UNH Cooperative Extension has county foresters working in all of our 10 counties. So our county and state specialists like myself, we work in close cooperation with the New Hampshire Division of Forests and Lands, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department, and with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And our staff are available to meet with you free of charge to help guide you through the steps of managing and conserving natural resources on your land. And we can put you in contact with professionals that you can hire to develop and implement forest management and, for, and habitat management plans on your property. And again, you can also, um, just for ease, you can contact direct me if you'd like to schedule a site visit. Again, my visit is free of charge and I always coordinate to have your county extension forester join uh, us for a walk on your land. And if you are already working with a consulting forester or with a logger, I also prefer to have those professionals join us for our visit as well. So what we say usually say is if you talk with 10 different foresters or natural resource professionals, you get 10 different ideas about what to do on your land. And, and uh, none, of, none are necessarily right or wrong. Um, everybody has a different approach and they're looking at things differently. And so in my experience, I think it's great to have everybody involved with managing a property to get together, to bounce ideas off of one another, one another so you can have the best possible information to help you make decisions on your land. So with that, I guess um, I would be happy to try to answer any questions that folks might have. And I think perhaps the uh, most efficient way to do that is to have folks um, either raise their hand or maybe type a question mark in the chat box and then um, I, can, I can call on you. And I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see more people here. Looks like we've got some some shy folks. Oh, here we go. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Um, what is the typical cost of removing trees? That's a great question. Um, and I'll give you the answer that we typically give. It depends. Uh, so uh, in an ideal world, it doesn't cost you anything, meaning that um, we try to, you know, uh, certain trees have commercial value, other trees don't. And so depending on the size of your trees and how many trees that you have, um, ideally when we plan a timber harvest, you are, if you're not making money, you're at least breaking even. And so um, that's the, that question is best answered by taking a look at your property to give you an idea about what the value of your trees are so you can make an informed decision. And so for me, you know, as a forester and wildlife biologist and educator, one of my goals is that is to try to get your property to pay for itself, at least over time. And so I often work with a lot of folks who say, I'm not interested in making money for my trees. I just want to manage the land for wildlife. Well, that's great. But if you're actually going to do any work, that work ends up, often ends up costing money. And so if you can, if, if you don't have deep pockets, that can, it can be expensive. And so ideally, if you, if you have a, a land that's large enough, that has enough trees and you can periodically remove a few of those trees to generate some revenue, that can be an incredibly valuable uh, resource for allowing you to maybe pay your taxes or maybe make a little bit of money or at least pay for the habitat work. And so if you'd like to know, you know what the value of your trees are, uh, drop me an email or give your county forester a call and we'd be more than happy to come take a, take a visit and give you some info. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there is another question in the chat here from Catherine. Um, you've talked about a variety of habitats for birds and wildlife. What's the most critical to restore or maintain? That's a fantastic question. And again, the answer to that question is it depends. It really depends on where you are in the state and, and what is going and what habitat conditions are around you. So, um, as a general rule, um, many folks have heard about the value of, of young forest and shrubland habitat, um, kind of those young forests, primarily because a lot of our a lot, a lot of the forest, a lot of the forest in our landscape, it's just naturally maturing. And so, as a general rule, a lot we, we're losing a lot of that shrubland habitat, which is required by many different wildlife species. And so, many in many areas of the state. 
shrublands, shrubland habitat, creating and maintaining that is a priority. However, in, in some areas, it's the big blocks of mature forest are becoming fragmented, especially in southern, in southern portions of the state. And so in, in some areas, it would be more in, important to not um, clear mature forest to make shrublands, but rather to uh, maintain the mature forest conditions. In some areas, it's as a general rule throughout New Hampshire, grassland habitats are quite uncommon. And so if you have large grassland habitats and, and if those habitats are supporting grassland dependent birds, often that rate that rises as a priority to consider from a conservation uh, standpoint. And so again, it really does depend on where you are and what is going on around you. You know, if you are, if you are in a sea of mature forest and in, in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of mature forest and your land is the same, then it might make sense for you to think about making a, a large opening or two to diversify and provide habitat that's uncommon. And so um, again, deciding what makes the most sense and what is most critical is best as assessed on the ground on your land and by looking at aerial photos so we can compare how your, how your land compares to the neighborhood. Great question. We've got a, a little lull here, so I'm going to use folks, one of the. Folks aren't super uh, active here, so if if uh, if you have a question, feel free to just go ahead and 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 speak up. We can. I don't. I think we have a a small enough group that we can manage that too. Yeah, absolutely. If people want to <clears throat> unmute, um, we've got some shy folks, so feel free to just jump on in. <laughs> um, I was actually going to ask if um, anyone with a smaller lot might be able to find ways to enhance their habitat. Um, you know, not, obviously not everybody has several hundred acres. So um, is there anything that we can do just as smaller lot owners that might be able to enhance even the habitat around us? Absolutely, we can provide habitat on, on land of any size. So you don't, you definitely don't need hundreds of acres. You don't even need tens of acres. You, I have 0.7, I own 0.7 acres and I actively work with that, with that area um, to make it as diverse as possible uh, to benefit wildlife. And so um, what I say, it doesn't matter how big your property is. Ideally, if you want to, if you want to enhance wildlife species diversity in your area and give wildlife a reason to use your property, we sh you should be managing your land in a way that complements the surrounding habitat. And so that is especially important as, as the size of your property um, decreases. Uh, and so what we, uh, the approach would be to again, get an idea of you know, what's on your land and how does it compare? Is it the same or is it different from what's, what's on neighboring properties? Because each wildlife species, wildlife don't recognize property boundaries. The vast majority of our wildlife species will use your land for a portion of their needs and they'll use neighboring lands or other areas in the landscape to meet their other needs. And so if, if you can provide something on your land that's unique, that wildlife require, that again, not only enhances the overall habitat um, availability and, and, and options in your neighborhood, but it gives wildlife species a reason to use your land. And so um, again, even, even small areas, things that you might think about is, you know, if, if you have the only uh, oak trees in your, in, in your neighborhood or the, or the only large oak trees in your, in your neighborhood, that becomes a priority to manage and encourage on your property. You know, maybe maybe you have uh, dead and dying trees and large snags or or, court or fallen woody material on the ground that other uh, other landowners cut down or clean up. You know, you providing that on your property, even on very small acreages, even less than an acre, can be a great way to enhance habitat and give critters a reason to use your land. So again, um, I we will visit properties. I visit properties of all sizes, and I'm and I am especially interested. In, in learning in uh, experimenting with different ways to enhance habitat um, on even very, very, very small properties in the backyard. So um, there was a question here about having access to the slides. Yeah, the best way to do that is um, would be to, uh, 
I guess email Gall. I'm not sure if, if Gall probably has your in, your information from the registration. I will send. Um, I'll actually. I think I actually have a recorded version of this, and I think you're recording this, right, Gall? Yep, we're recording, and I do have everybody's email and whatever other information you gave me in your registration. So I'll yeah, be sending so out an email uh, about next week when the recording is up on the YouTube channel. Yep. And so uh, if you if you would like a PDF version of this presentation, I could put that together relatively quickly in the next few days. And so if you'd like that, you can email me directly at matt.tar uh, at unh.edu, M-A-T-T dot T-A-R-R at unh.edu. So there's a couple other question here, questions here. Is water access needed in each type of field sizes? Um, it's interesting, water and uh, water is a, obviously all wildlife species need water, but the, but the, but many wildlife don't necessarily need access to like standing water. So for example, many of the bird species, the grassland bird species, they get the vast majority of their water from the insects that they eat. Um, and also if, uh, if you go into a field habitat very early in the morning, pretty much every morning in the middle of the summer and you walk through that field habitat, by the time you get out to the other side, your pants will be absolutely soaked. Um, that tall grass habitat is usually filled with dew. And so uh, a, a huge variety of wildlife species, birds, insects, and especially small mammals get a large amount of their water needs from dew that accumulates on the vegetation. And so most of the, the grassland birds don't really need open water. And the vast majority of other wildlife species don't need that open water too. But if you have, if you have open water within a wetland, then that just further enhances the habitat diversity. You can pull in amphibians and turtles, and um, there's additional insects that are often born in that water that can further enhance foraging opportunities for birds, especially. Um, you did not talk much about wetlands and floodplains. Should they be left mostly intact uh, in, in mostly intact in mature trees? Yeah, we don't do too much work in floodplains themselves. They're relatively uncommon habitats and they're difficult to work in. Um, I don't, I can't remember ever, me personally ever conducting any sort of timber harvesting in floodplains. Um, with regards to wetlands, we don't do a lot of work directly in wetlands in New Hampshire. A lot of the work that we do in, a lot of the habitat and forestry work that we do in relation to wetlands is conducted around the immediate edges of wetlands. And so um, there's all sorts of, there's a number of, of situations where we would timber harvest immediately adjacent to wetlands. Again, doing so, there are, there are requirements that we need to follow to be sure that we're not having impacts to those wetlands. But historically, a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the tree disturbance happened along wetland edges by beavers. And so um, that does happen in, in a lot of situations, but sometimes we will mimic what beavers will do um, by through timber harvesting, by making small, you know, small openings, sometimes small clear cuts that sometimes go right to the edge of, of wetlands for the purpose of one, oftentimes encouraging beavers to stay within a wetland because when we make a small clear cut and we throw a bunch of sunlight on the ground around that wetland edge, it tends to get shrubby, it tends to get filled in with herbaceous plants, which are all preferred beaver food. And so if you want to uh, keep beavers in a wetland that you have, or encourage them to come back to a wetland that they've abandoned, timber harvesting can be a great tool to do that. And then the shrubby habitat that gets created near that wetland provides ideal browse and cover for a wide range of different wildlife species. Um, and so we often do do forestry work, timber harvesting near wetlands, but again, it has to be done in a manner that's, that's careful. You know, around streams in particular, oftentimes we aren't removing over the overstory around streams or over like vernal pools or temporary wetlands. The idea is in most situations, it's best to keep those shaded. You know, if they, if they are shaded, to keep them shaded by not removing the overstory immediately over them. So we're maintaining cool water temperatures, which are especially valuable for brook trout and uh, cool water temperatures for, um, for the amphibians as well. Um, our neighbors in our subdivision have been taking advantage of free tree removal, primarily white pines. What benefits does this species in particular provide that I can tell people to encourage them to keep some pines? Well, that's actually a bigger question than you might have anticipated. So we strongly 
Anytime somebody says that they're going to come to your property to cut trees for free, that's a big red, should be a big red flag for you. So um, before you have any trees cut on your property, we strongly encourage you to call your county extension, cooperative extension forester. Again, the call, it's a free visit to come out and take a look. Those trees may have value. Um, and also you want to be sure that you are working with people who are, you know, well insured, especially if they're cutting trees that are, you know, within striking distance of your home. Uh, you want to be sure that they, that they have all of the proper insurance and that they're following all of the, the laws and regulations. You also want to be sure that you have a contract. Um, so you are 100% sure that when they remove their equipment and they, they are gone, that the job is left in the, in the condition that you want it to be in. I have seen countless numbers of just absolute horror sto stories from situations where people took advantage of the, I will cut your trees for free approach. So if, if you see that before, I'm not telling you to not, to not go ahead, but before you hire anybody, be sure to have a consulting forester or your county forester, just come out to take a look so you're sure that you are entering into that, uh, into that agreement with that contractor with the best information that you have. So the benefit of white pines, white pines certainly do have habitat benefit, perhaps not as much as a variety of other species. And again, the, the overall habitat value of particular white pines largely depends on what's going, what else is around them. So again, you know, I tell folks, you know, if, if if you are surrounded, if your property is surrounded by a, a hundred acre apple orchard and you want to attract wildlife to your land, planting a single apple tree probably isn't the way to do it. Um, again, because that single apple tree isn't going to pull in the, the wildlife species away from hundreds of acres of apples. So similarly, you know, if you have, if you have white pines on your property and all of the surrounding land is surrounded by white pines, then the loss of individual white pines probably is just a drop in the bucket and doesn't matter a whole lot to, you know, to the overall wildlife in your area. But if your land has some of the only white pines or maybe you have uh, your white pines grow in clusters where they can not only provide seeds but also good cover, then the habitat value of those trees might increase. You might also just particularly like white pines. So that's one of the best things about being a landowner is you don't have to cut anything you don't want to. So you can keep any trees that you that you like. So again, the value is really dependent on all trees, all shrubs, all plants have habitat value. They all have habitat value. And so the how they rank in value is really dependent on how unique they are and how they compare to what's going on, on on other areas of your property and in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, question here from Marilyn. I'm thinking about making some nest boxes specifically for owls. How successful are nest boxes? Nest boxes can be really successful for certain species um, and it really depends on if there are you know, natural cavities um, available. So um, birds that we will, will often can benefit the most from nest boxes often include like the, the cavity nesting birds that nest um, in, and, in and around field edges. So those would be like the tree swallows and the Eastern bluebirds, primarily because those birds require open habitats for foraging. And in a lot of areas, there aren't large trees that have natural cavities for those bird species. And so what we find is that when we put out nesting boxes in those habitats, nesting sites are like a limiting factor. And so as soon as we put out nesting boxes, there's all sorts of spots for those birds to suddenly nest and they use them immediately. And so nesting boxes can be a great way to enhance habitat, again, for swallows and, and bluebirds in those fields where there aren't natural cavities available. Nesting boxes for owls, for wood ducks, for mergansers are often quite successful too, primarily because those species are all large body birds and they, they generally require trees that are at least 16 to 18 inches in diameter and hollow for nesting. And those are relatively uncommon features on our land, but just primarily because of the fact that most of our land has had timber harvesting, you know, the entire area was cleared, you know, not too, too long ago for agriculture and a lot of our land just hasn't had a chance to grow back. And so if you, if you live in a landscape where there's lots of large trees with cavities and you add a nesting box, it may not necessarily get used. But I guess my experience with 
wood duck boxes and with owl boxes is that usually within a few seasons, they're usually used um, by those species, primarily because those large diameter nesting sites are uncommon. Yeah. Bat boxes are another one that people often ask questions about. <clears throat> bat boxes, bat boxes are a little more hit or miss. Um, bat boxes can certainly have value again in habitats where there aren't nesting uh, roosting sites available for bats. Um, however, you know, in a in a previous life, I worked for a, a small company that used to uh, get bats out of people's houses, and we would plug up houses to be sure the bats couldn't get in them. And our general rule was is that if you could put two pencils side by side into a hole, that was large enough for a bat to get into your house. And so if you if you think about how many holes of that size are in your woods, they're everywhere. And so bats usually aren't really lacking for, for roost sites. And so a lot of folks will put up bat boxes and they're discouraged that the bats don't use them. But then suddenly one year there's bats in them. So um, yeah. You can put up bat boxes. Don't get discouraged if they don't use them. Eventually they will. Are there any other questions? Great questions. Yeah, so following up on the bat boxes, um, yeah. are there any types of habitat that we should be thinking about for um, trying to encourage bats? Yeah, so bats need a couple primary habitats. They need places to, they roost during the day and, the, and, and then they forage usually over openings in the evening and at night. And so roosting habitat is usually forest usually mature forests that have trees that have cavities or, or dead and dying trees that have loose bark um, where the bats will roost underneath the bark. And, um, and so th those roost trees can be way out in the middle of your forest. They can be along the edges of fields. We find bats regularly roosting in, in dead trees that we leave way out in the middle of clear cuts. Those bats can roost in your, in your barn, in your home. We get them regularly find them underneath the um, our patio umbrellas you know they they roost in a wide variety of situations but at night they require foraging habitat and they're foraging almost entirely on flying insects primarily moths and beetles a, few, a little bit of mosquitoes but primarily moths and beetles you know over fields over wetlands over forest openings like clear cuts and group cuts and so one of the I guess a, it's a general rule, you know, having, maintaining that habitat diversity is key. Maintaining, maintaining dead and dying trees and trees that have holes and cavities in them is a really easy way to, to maintain and provide potential roosting sites for bats. Um, and then um, if you have openings on your property or if you don't have openings, maybe periodically making some of those openings either through, you know, through timber harvesting or if you have fields, you know, following that recommendation to enhance the plant diversity in your openings, either by allowing those openings to, to grow up into some wildflowers, or even ideally having a combination of wildflowers and shrubs, is a fantastic way for enhancing insect diversity. And insect diversity means more food for the bats. And so as a general rule, think that every time that you, that you can encourage an, one more plant species, each plant species has different insects that are associated with it. So, so plant diversity results in insect diversity. And so if you can manage your openings to support a diversity of plants, those openings will tend to support a diversity of insects, which invariably are going to provide a greater abundance and variety of food for, for things that eat insects, including bats. And reducing Complete, ideally completely eliminating all chemicals on your property. You know, so all, any sorts of, especially pesticides, insecticides, you know, if you can, if you can avoid those sorts of chemicals, that's a fantastic way for maintaining and enhancing um, insect numbers for those, for those insect numbers. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Great question. So, Unless there are any other questions, we're about three minutes from 
from the end. I just want to give anyone that might be sitting on their hands a chance to to speak up. Um, how oh, here we go. How are invasive species affecting birds? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> As right, long a, as you've got an audience. <laughs> yeah, I I actually went back to school to, and got a PhD to try to figure that out, and I still haven't figured it out. So uh, that's an incredibly complex topic. So, uh, you know, as a, as a general rule, we humans like to put things in neat and tidy boxes. And so with regards to invasive plants, what we typically find is people say non-native invasive bad native plants good you know it just doesn't it's just not that easy so you know all all plants have habitat value and so even even the invasive plants many of the invasive plants were originally introduced into so invasive plants are plants that are usually non-native plants plants that came from a different country that were usually introduced here to this country by people you know that wouldn't have that had to have come across the an ocean uh, in without somebody transporting them or would have been unlikely to come here. And these plants, some of these plants have become invasive, meaning that they grow very aggressively and they have the potential in some habitats to outcompete native plants. And so there's lots of concern for that. When a plant becomes super invasive, really when any plant becomes super invasive and forms what we call a monoculture or a near monoculture where it grows as the only species that's there, that's not great for wildlife. Again, habitat, plant diversity as a general rule provides great habitat. And so if, if a habitat becomes dominated by a single species, that creates, that means that that habitat is all one structure. It all, it, you know, all the seeds are the same, all the fruits are the same. And so when the fruit production of that plant is, is high, that's great, but when it's not, it's not. So you get these kind of peaks and valleys. And so, I'll just say that um, their invasive plants are a concern. Um, they're often primarily a concern for many of our insects. Um, many, all plants produce chemicals to keep things from eating them. Um, what we find is that as a general rule, you know, most, many of our invasive plants, especially those that don't have native relatives, they come with, they produce chemicals that many of our native insects just haven't evolved to tolerate. And so as a general rule, we find that most of our non-native and especially our invasive plants support very few pollinating insects, at least the caterpillars. Um, adult pollinators will regularly um, forage for nectar and pollen on these plants, but the, many of the caterpillars can't eat them as a host. And so habitats that are dominated by non-native invasive plants tend to support very few caterpillars, which are you know, not only, they're important in their own right, but that's also a very important food for many songbirds. But we find here in New Hampshire that um, you know, our, my research in particularly has found that, you know, sites need to be really heavily invaded before we see significant reductions in habitat quality for wildlife. So we are concerned about invasive plants. They all have habitat value, but we want to encourage native plants whenever we can and try to discourage situations where any plant can form a monoculture. So that's a that's a quick way to answer a very complex topic. And um, if you have specific questions about that, I actually have other presentations that I can direct you to, um, recorded presentations. So you can send me an email and I'd be happy to send you links to those. And then um, if you're dealing with invasive plants on your property, again, decisions about whether to remove or control invasive plants and how to go about that are best made property by property. And um, myself and many of my colleagues regularly deal with those questions. So um, feel free to give us a buzz, happy to help. Fantastic. Can you, I'm not you're sure only one minute over. Question, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Linda, if you wanna speak up, if you have a, a clarifier or you want a little bit more detail, we'll let this run for a few more minutes <laughs> before we cut it off. Um, and so, as Linda thinks about it, I just want to thank Japanese you, Matt. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hold on, what, Linda's, Linda. Yeah, has Linda, some please. Questions. Japanese knotweed is one of the biggest problems I've seen. Japanese knotweed. 
Yeah, I send me an email. I have a uh, I have a video recorded video of of uh, what I did with the knotweed on my property. Uh, I have uh, I went through pretty much a three year battle um, to control pretty much completely eradicate knotweed on my property without using chemicals. So it's a it's a huge effort, a major challenge. Um, I have a recorded presentation that documents the steps that I took and you can decide whether it's right or not on your property. Knotweed's a challenge. Knotweed is one of the most aggressive plants that we deal with. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges from, for, for knotweed is just that, that is one of the plants that really has the ability to form true monocultures, like to grow so dense and thick that nothing else can grow. And, and once, once that gets established, it's very, very difficult uh, to control that plant. And so it doesn't really produce a food uh, it in and it creates kind of a, a simplified structure that some critters will use. Um, it will it does provide good cover uh, for a variety of species. It's fantastic pollinator habitat. In the fall, it's like absolutely loaded with pollinators. So again, even the worst of the worst does have habitat value. But that for me, that's a that's a species a, a plant species that I'm very very. Uh, aware of and if it as soon as you see it on your property you should address it immediately because once it gets established it is very very difficult to control especially if you aren't interested in using chemicals yep. i have a friend who says goats really like it so you could get some goats <laughs> yeah they can and again they can as long as you don't have a lot of it and um the but what i have found you know you know, I have I have like played the role of a goat using my you know, weed whacker and, and whatnot. And um, man, if if it's well established, you can't cut it fast enough. You just can't maintain it. You know, through mechanical means, it's very very difficult to control. Yeah. I guess we better learn how to monetize it so that we can pull out of the ground and make good of it. <laughs> you can eat it, but you can't eat enough of it. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's great have the whole strawberry. family over <laughs> it's like it tastes like rhubarb so it's great in like strawberry knotweed pies but you know it yeah. even you know we had a, we had an area that was like oh it's probably like 70 by 100 on our property that was like complete knotweed and we just i mean we could have fed the town you know knotweed pies like every day for the year and we just and by the time we got a cut we turn around it was grown back again it was just you just can't eat enough of it <laughs> oh man well thank you so much um yeah, absolutely. this has been really lovely really really great to have you back um and i'm sure that everybody enjoyed it as much as as i did as i said awesome. we do have this recorded so uh, you guys can come back to it anytime you want and um thank you all for taking time to to spend with us today hope to see you again soon Awesome. Please, please don't hesitate to drop me an email if you have any questions or if you'd like to uh, schedule a visit on your property. Uh, again, I say your call and email gets us out of the office, so please don't hesitate. So look forward to meeting you in person. Fantastic. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>